is a tape-recorded oral history interview with General Sam Phillips. The interviewer is Martin Collins. The date is February 23, 1988. This is tape one, side one. Uh, we like to begin our discussion uh, with a sense of uh, your very early background, uh, where and when you were born, uh, who your parents were. I was born on February 19, 1921. In Springerville, Arizona. Uh, Springerville is, was then and still is a, uh, uh, a forestry camp in the mountains of Arizona, uh, some miles out from Flagstaff, which is better known. Uh, when I was born, my father was an electrician in uh, a sawmill uh, in, uh, in Springerville. Uh, see, my father, Clarence Arthur Phillips, was born in uh, Springfield, Illinois, and he was uh, 27 years old when I was born. Uh, uh, he, he was an electrician by trade. Uh, and was uh, uh, had great ambitions to be a a Protestant minister, so he was a part-time minister as well as earning a living as an electrician. Uh, my mother, uh, Mabel Gertrude Cochran, was her maiden name. Uh, was born. Uh, in Nebraska, she also was 27 years old when I was born. Uh, I was the first uh, child in their family. Uh, uh, we, my fa uh, family moved uh, north from uh, Arizona up into Colorado when I was only a few months old. Uh, my first uh, real memories uh, go back to when we lived in Denver, Colorado, and this would have been when I was uh, four or five years old. Uh, my father still was an electrician, and uh, that was, of course, how he earned his living. By then, he was with the uh, Public Service Company of Colorado. Uh, he was, an, was a lineman. Uh, that was one of the electrical utilities in Colorado? Yes, it was the uh, utility company that provided electric power, uh, uh, at least in Denver, and I'm sure through much of Colorado, and for that matter, on up into Wyoming. Uh, so my family moved uh, when I was only a few months old from Arizona. Uh, to Colorado, uh, first I think to Pueblo, and uh, then on up to Denver, and a little later to uh, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and a little later to Brighton, Colorado, and then in about 1920, uh, 28, uh, moved uh, to Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, which is where I really grew up. Uh, I grew up then in, in Cheyenne, went to public school there. Why uh, uh, was your family moving so much? Was that part of the requirement for, for alignment at that time? Well, I don't know that it was a requirement for alignment, but I think it was uh, a requirement in order to earn a living in, in those years to... Uh, to go where the where there was a need for uh, uh, for his for that skill, and I really don't know the details of uh, what the sure. economics that uh, caused th that migration to occur, but uh, but it it had to do with where the where there were jobs, and uh, I'm sure as he was with the same public service company for many years that uh, uh, the opportunities uh, were greater uh, uh, further north up that, 
up that line, uh, winding up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Did he uh, continue uh, as, an as, an, as an electrician uh, while in Cheyenne? Yes, uh, my, uh, my father's living, or uh, he always earned a living as, as a lineman and electrician. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in 1945, uh, was uh, killed in an electrical accident uh, on a pole as a lineman, uh, that occurring while I was overseas in World War II. Uh, I mentioned that my father had, had uh, great ambitions to be a, uh, to be a, a Protestant minister. Uh, he had, uh, at some point before I was born, uh, uh, attended uh, Moody Bible Institute in Denver and uh, had reached a, a level of, uh, of uh, education and uh, theology that, that uh, qualified him for a license to, uh, to preach uh, and so that during all of his adult life, then, uh, his avocation uh, uh, and what I think he really wanted to do was to be a minister. I can remember in my youth, uh, in living in Wyoming, accompanying him on Sundays out to uh, the prairie country where he had, uh, uh, where he was their Sunday minister on uh, on Sunday out in the ranch areas in, uh, in uh, eastern Wyoming. Uh, uh, my my uh, uh, technical interests, I think, started uh, with, uh, with my father, uh, uh, who really was uh, was a very capable uh, and he was not an engineer he was not educated as an engineer uh, but as an electrician uh, uh, he certainly knew how electricity and electrical machines uh, worked and uh, my early technical education uh, largely started as a very young child uh, with learning from my father about how electricity worked and on from there uh, uh, electrical machines and uh, uh, Did he have some kind of uh, workshop in the house? Uh, I had a workshop in our house in, a, in the basement and uh, uh, it was uh, in that workshop uh, that uh, my father coached me and instructed me and in, uh, as i as i've mentioned were you developing interest in things like radio was that where you were uh, directing your interest or were you looking at other aspects of, of you know? uh, my interests really uh, uh, were always toward uh, radio and uh, what has become the the uh, world of electronics and uh, and uh, communications. Uh, at a very young age, uh, uh, I developed a very consuming interest in radio. Uh, and I can still remember when I w was probably in about the fourth grade, which would have been uh, probably 1930 or 31, uh, <clears throat> when my father brought home uh, uh, the fir our first uh, radio, I remember, it was an Atwater Kent uh, uh, radio, and I remember uh, spending endless hours uh, uh, tuning around and and uh, listening to the various stations that we could receive out there. Uh, in that same period, I. Uh, uh, I guess largely by self-instruction and uh, with some coaching uh, from my father, uh, 
started to build radio equipment, starting with the uh, uh, with a typical crystal set. Uh, there too, I can remember spending uh, hours, especially at night, uh, tuning around and listening to various uh, radio stations. Uh, I mentioned that I had a workshop in the basement of our house uh, there in Cheyenne. And I did build a, a, a number of, of uh, pieces of radio equipment of that era, uh, radio receivers. And I also learned enough uh, through largely self-instruction to uh, get an amateur radio license and uh, then built transmitting equipment and set up a amateur radio station there in our house. So were you instructing yourself? Were you looking at, at popular periodicals like Popular Mechanics, uh, relying on the public library? Uh, how did that work? Uh, it was, uh, I can remember Popular Mechanics and Popular Science, both of which uh, I uh, uh, read uh, regularly as a... Uh, young boy. Uh, also, uh, uh, I should mention that uh, my father's older brother, my Uncle Harry, lived in, uh, Den in uh, Boulder, Colorado, not in Boulder, he lived in Brighton, Colorado, which is 25 or so miles north of Denver. And uh, my uh, uncle uh, was also an electrician and also a lineman, as my father. But his interests, uh, many years earlier, had developed along the line of, uh, of radio technology. And he was one of the early amateurs in the, that, w that was licensed. Uh, and he was a builder of... Uh, uh, what in in the 20s and 30s were uh, were advanced technology devices, uh, th largely through his interest in uh, amateur radio. Uh, he built some of his own vacuum tubes, and he made what I'm sure were some of the very first uh, uh, very high frequency uh, tubes, triodes. Uh, for use in the amateur five meter band, I remember. So I spent uh, time with my uncle uh, in the summer, uh, at least in two summers, I spent time with him. I learned a lot from him about radios and designing and building them. And I think through him and, uh, and acquiring an amateur radio license, uh, I became a member of the ARRL, the American Radio Relay League, which is, goes back uh, to the early part of this century in the amateur radio business. And they've been the publisher of uh, radio handbooks uh, since the early part of the century. So I used their handbook uh, uh, for a lot of that learning also. Uh, yes, they did. Uh, uh, they, they encouraged it. I, uh, I know actively on the part of my father, and uh, uh, so yes, the answer is yes. It definitely was encouraged. Yeah. Uh, did you have any uh, uh, other siblings? Yes, I was uh, the oldest of uh, six children. I had. Uh, two sisters and three brothers. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, 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 the, th the three brothers uh, uh, stayed in Cheyenne, Wyoming all their lives and uh, they still live out in that area. Uh, The brothers chose, I guess for their own reasons, uh, to not complete a college education. And uh, uh, they, 
well, they've been quite satisfied to uh, follow various trade activities and stay in uh, stay in Wyoming. I think that introduces or brings to mind a, an important subject, though. It, uh, in uh, I think starting in junior high school, which would have been there in those years through the eighth grade, uh, somewhere probably in the eighth grade. A person, uh, a teacher at that time, he was a teacher in the manual arts, the shops of metal working and uh, woodworking and so on, uh, which I was always very interested in and, and uh, I, as I recall, did well in. Uh, but uh, the teacher took an interest in, uh, in my development. It wasn't obvious to me at that time, but in retrospect certainly was. And he was a member of the Kiwanis Club, and uh, on a few occasions uh, uh, would take me to the Kiwanis lunch and uh, introduce me at least to that element of life, which was quite different than, than anything I was used to. Uh, then in high school, uh, I was not uh, an, not an enthusiastic student, and certainly not one that uh, fell in the category of uh, of the intellectual or the the uh, high uh, you know the high achiever in grades. Uh, a person uh, named Paul Albright, who was a teacher, uh, took an interest and uh, 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 did. I can recall uh, quite a bit of count, personal counseling, uh, counseling me to do better in school, for other, among other things, and to get better grades. But uh, in the end, uh, he took the initiative to get a scholarship for me to the University of Wyoming, w without which I probably wouldn't have gone to college. And. Uh, I mention that because it uh, has been a lesson to me all my life of the uh, importance uh, of, of the profound effect that individuals can have on other individuals. And by the simple act of uh, those two teachers that I've mentioned uh, taking uh, a personal interest in, a, in me as an individual, and in the case of Albright, uh, taking the initiative to uh, help me get a, a simple scholarship to the university. Uh, so just Albright's uh, uh, area of responsibility at the high school? Uh, he was, uh, I think, what today probably would be called a dean of boys, although it wasn't, didn't have that title. Uh, he had, uh, I think his specialty also was in in uh, the sciences and in uh, the, uh, the the manual arts uh, fields. Uh, but he was more at that time a counselor, a senior counselor, and uh, uh, well, to I guess to get a few more specifics. I uh, went to public schools in Cheyenne, uh, graduating from uh, uh, Cheyenne High School in the summer of 1938. Uh, uh, I <clears throat> went then in the fall of 1938 to the University of Wyoming and enrolled as a freshman in uh, electrical engineering, and uh, graduated from the University of Wyoming in 1942 with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Uh, the engineering school at the University of Wyoming in those years, the electrical engineering curriculum, uh, was devoted entirely to electrical power. Uh, uh, to my uh, recollection, uh, uh, 
electronics as a field hadn't yet been identified. And I can remember in, I think it was uh, late 1941 when uh, a young professor uh, was hired onto the staff of uh, the Electrical Engineering School. Uh, the professor having come from, as I recall, Ohio, and he had been educated in uh, some of the fundamentals of uh, uh, what later became electronics, and uh, he gave lectures in energy levels of electrons and things that were very, very exciting to me, having spent all my education up to that point in the mundane, uh, sort of boring uh, elements of electrical machinery and power transmission and so on. So this was one of your first introductions to, to basic physics in some sense, or advanced physics yes. at this point. Yes, very, very definitely. Uh, I, uh, with apology for skipping around, uh, I should go back to uh, my upbringing there in Cheyenne. I've mentioned my <coughs> interest in uh, radio uh, and uh, it was probably while I was in, the, say, the ninth grade that uh, I walked one day from the high school to up to the airport, which was a relatively short distance by distance by modern standards, and. Uh, uh, walked into what was then the CAA, Civil Aeronautics Authority radio station, and introduced myself and uh, uh, I said I just wanted to see a, see their equipment and their station. Well, that led to uh, an association that in some ways persisted right up to now. Uh, uh, the operators in that little radio station kind of took me under their wing, it turned out, and uh, I had a lot to do with uh, um, my education and, and knowledge of uh, radio and radio communications. Uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming in the 30s, and I guess even up into the 40s, was a... a a hub or a center of uh, uh, transportation in the in the western part of the country. Uh, resuming our discussion after we pause. Uh, I was saying that uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, in the early part of this century, uh, was a, a hub of transportation. Uh, it was the main, on the main line of the Union Pacific Railroad, and some significant fraction of the of the uh, payroll in Cheyenne came from the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, it was the uh, east-west, north-south hub for uh, air traffic in those years. And United Airlines had their uh, their main maintenance shops there in on the airport in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, and so Cheyenne was was a, a hub point in the Federal Airways system at that time, and had <coughs> uh, the navigation aids of that period, which were the very low frequency radio range devices that are no longer used, at least in this country, uh, and had. Uh, 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 regular broadcasts of uh, airways weather for both the east-west airway uh, through Cheyenne and for the north-south north airway through Cheyenne. Uh, the north-south airway ran from Tucumcari, New Mexico to Billings, Montana with uh, Cheyenne being the main uh, hub point for uh, communications and uh, east-west of course uh, the weather broadcasts used to uh, go out uh, uh, at least to uh, Nevada uh, 
and uh, to the east out through uh, Nebraska. Uh, uh, but Cheyenne also had a, a, a very high frequency uh, CW or continuous wave code, Morse code uh, uh, station that would gather the weather reports along those north, south, and east, west airways. And uh, that's where I really gained some of my proficiency in Morse code was these radio operators, as I say, who kind of took me on uh, as a kid. Uh, this is kind of an informal thing where you hung around, or did they sort of uh, well, bring you it, in and ask you to do little jobs? Well, <laughs> it started out as an informal thing with them taking an interest in me uh, as a kid, uh, uh, who had a great interest. And uh, I've forgotten just when it occurred, but somewhere along the way they gave me a job as the janitor for their station, and I think I earned uh, something like $10 a week uh, going in there, I guess probably about every day, and sweeping the place out, and on weekends uh, waxing the floor and so on, so I in some ways uh, earned, earned my keep there, but uh, uh, but there again I guess you, is an example of how uh, adults uh, taking some interest in an individual can pretty profoundly influenced their lives. I mentioned that uh, in the case of some teachers. What, what was the influence <clears throat> there, the thing that you derived from that experience? Uh, a lot of learning about uh, uh, airways, navigation aids, communications, uh, uh, electrical radio communications. Uh, I remember I did uh, a paper at the University of Wyoming on how the the low frequency range operated, uh, which in terms of, of the curriculum of the University of Wyoming, which was entirely power, was, uh, 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 I suppose, was contributory and unique, but uh, well, that was a very sophisticated uh, radio device. Uh, even today it would be how the, uh, the 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 course lines are created in in uh, with radio uh, uh, using uh, the generation of radio frequency signals and the modulating of those and how uh, directional patterns are established in the radiation of those energies to create. Uh, the alternate uh, A's and N's in the Morse code, which uh, on the course lines uh, become solid signals. Uh, that's just. Uh, what, what's the significance of the A's and N's <laughs> in, in that description? Well, an A is a dot dash and an N is a dash dot. Right. And if you impose or superimpose the A and the N in a proper way, uh, the dots fill the spaces and you have a, a, a solid line if you visualize right. imposing A's and N's in a way, uh, dots and dashes, that you create a solid line. Uh, and in an oversimplified way, that's how the generation of radio signals and the transmission of those uh, in a directional sense create the course lines, which were the solid signals. And if you were off the course line, you had in one direction an A signal and in the other direction an N signal, so you knew which quadrant you were in. But uh, as I say, that, that um, element of learning uh, uh, came up, the opportunity for that came about by, by uh, my walking into this CAA radio station and uh, the uh, operators there were uh, taking an interest in over quite a period of, uh, quite a number of years then through high school and and even on through college. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of time in that radio station, uh, both contributing in an informal or in a non-employee sense and, uh, and learning. Uh, that 
being on the edge of the airport uh, then really introduced me to airplanes and to flying. And uh, one of the uh, radio operators there in the station uh, himself had quite an interest in flying. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, was a part owner in, a, in an airplane. And uh, so largely through, through his activities, I uh, uh, then uh, wound up learning to fly which is an, another brief story in itself. By... Uh, this was during high school. Yes, this was during high school. Uh, I've forgotten just what year it was, but it was... Uh, it probably was 1938. Uh, as I say, I've, I've forgotten just when this occurred, whether it was while I was in, still in high school or after I'd gone over to the university. Uh, the war in Europe, of course, was uh, was already starting to build up. So I guess it would have had to had to be after I went to the university, starting in what 1939 with with the German invasion of uh, Poland and those eastern countries. So somewhere in the 39-40 period. Uh, a program was established called Civilian Pilot Training. And under that program, uh, uh, individuals who qualified had the opportunity to enroll in a, in a course of flying instruction. And uh, so when that opportunity presented itself, I did enroll in the primary civilian pilot training there in Cheyenne, and uh, through that program, uh, had the the uh, my initial uh, flying training and got a private pilot's license. And I followed that primary course up over in Laramie at the university by enrolling in the uh, advanced civilian pilot training program. Uh, which was offered uh, there in Laramie, it was not really a part of the uh, university curriculum, but it was available. And through that program, I uh, acquired more advanced skills in flying. And through those two civilian pilot training programs and then working around the airport uh, uh, to earn uh, and being paid in flying time, uh, by the time I graduated from college, I had probably of the order of 300 hours of flying. And uh, in the latter part of that, I was beginning to earn some of my flying time by uh, uh, installing uh, uh, intercom equipment in these open cockpit airplanes we were using. And uh, sort of beginning the uh, activities, if you will, of, uh, of uh, well, airplanes and communication. Uh, if we could just uh, go back for a second. Uh, what was the uh, uh, effect, if, if any, of the uh, economic downturn, the depression, uh, on your family or on, on your school activities? Uh, profound. <laughs> Uh, my family was uh, was really a poor family. Uh, the uh, the salary of my father uh, uh, with the public service company as a lineman was uh, was meager. Uh, it was uh, adequate to provide uh, the basics for a large family, which we were a family of six children. Uh, and two adults, uh, but there was uh, never anything left over, uh, and it was a, it was a poor existence, and of course that was uh, <clears throat> much of that uh, uh, period was during the depression. Uh, uh, I I. Uh, 
think probably to my own advantage, uh, I was more or less on my own uh, uh, to earn uh, anything, any spending money, or and and to some extent even to contribute to the to the family income uh, from a pretty young age. Uh, I think my own opinion is that was to the advantage of my development. Uh, but with uh, jobs like the one I mentioned, uh, being the janitor in the CAA radio station, which was really a pleasure because it gave me an opportunity to <laughs> uh, uh, to learn and be exposed to uh, the people that I, I was associated with. Uh, but my summer jobs were... Uh, uh, also great learning experiences. Uh, I was an electrician's helper during the summer there in Cheyenne uh, for uh, uh, an electrical company, Stevenson Electric, I uh, remember the name, uh, which company uh, uh, wired houses and commercial buildings. They were a construction business uh, doing the wiring. Uh, and <clears throat> of course I was was I guess equipped some to some extent uh, uh, because of the knowledge that I'd <clears throat> gained from my father. <clears throat> but uh, I learned a lot during those summer jobs and Interestingly enough, over <clears throat> my life, I've probably rewired every house we've ever lived in, including this one. Uh, was, was this uh, during the summers during your high school years or your, your college years? Uh, both. It was both. Uh, uh, pay was not very good in those years. I'm trying to trying to remember just what I got paid. It wasn't more than about $10 a week uh, during summer jobs. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't very much. Uh, uh, I guess, in, well, I should also mention that I think the last two summers of college, uh, I worked uh, in the uh, electrical generating plant there in Cheyenne, Wyoming. That was the same company that my father worked for as a lineman. And uh, uh, so there too I learned a lot about uh, power plants and industrial installations and uh, through uh, hard labor of, uh, of working on these big steam turbines and the steam piping systems and the boilers and the electrical distribution equipment in that uh, power plant. So you were getting a pretty basic grounding in, in the really practical aspects of, of uh, electrical engineering, if you will. Yes, very much so. <laughs> and with the diversity of uh, electrical power and uh, radio and, and uh, communications, uh, uh, undergraduate uh, tenure approached. Uh, the war had started. Uh, the international scene had been in, in turmoil for a couple of years. Uh, what, what were, were you uh, in, a, in a position to be drafted? Uh, what was the situation uh, there among the students who were um, eligible for the draft as, as the war started? Uh. Well, to answer that question directly, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the there was not any feeling of pressure of the draft uh, that I can remember among the, the student populace. Uh, it was almost the reverse. It was uh, uh, an enthusiastic willingness to uh, and a, and a strong desire to uh, to become involved. So. At least during the period that I was there, uh, the revulsion over uh, Pearl Harbor uh, 
which occurred in December of 41. So therefore, it was right uh, very near the time when I graduated in the in the spring of 1942. So the the whole atmosphere was was one of of revulsion and the desire to be involved. Uh, uh, I'm sure later the uh, uh, the attitudes changed, but uh, at least while I was there, uh, it was almost the reverse of any any apprehension over and fear of the draft. Yeah. I, but, I guess what I'm getting at was uh, the possibility, you know, you invested three, almost four years in your education, that the possibility might arise that you might not get to complete it. Was I wonder whether that was a concern? Uh, well, it turned out that it was not, and it was uh, largely the timing, because I say December of uh, the Pearl Harbor occurred uh, roughly six months from w from when I was scheduled to graduate, and for a variety of reasons, uh, uh, I and most of the other, at least the engineering seniors, uh, were allowed uh, or even encouraged to finish our our work and really to to satisfy the requirements for the degree uh, uh, in the spring, as opposed to going on through to June. Uh, but this prompts me to, that I should mention another strong line of, along my development. Uh, uh, the Reserve Officer Training Program, ROTC, was big in uh, Wyoming uh, in those years, and that was a fact even well before any inklings of what became World War II uh, came on the scene. Uh, 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 the University of Wyoming was a land-grant uh, uh, college. It was in those years the only university in that state, which is what is a small state. Uh, and one of the requirements of uh, land-grant uh, colleges uh, was to uh, uh, conduct uh, an ROTC program. Now, I think that was universally a requirement, but it was certainly my understanding of the uh, of of the requirements there at the university. Now, let me, I'll come back to the university, but going back to my high school days, uh, the uh, uh, high school at Cheyenne had a, a a very active ROTC program, and as I remember, it was a mandatory for say freshmen. In uh, high school, to uh, to take ROTC, uh, uh, I was attracted to uh, ROTC uh, and uh, pursued it very vigorously, and so I was uh, active in the ROTC program up through my graduation from high school, and. Uh, uh, had achieved one of the senior cadet officer positions there in the in the uh, cadet uh, corps at high school, and so I then became quite active in the ROTC program at the University of Wyoming. And uh, uh, at the university, uh, I suppose probably in my third year uh, as a as a junior, the professor of military science and tactics, he was an army colonel, uh, Malcolm E. Craig was his name, uh, uh, urged me to uh, take a competitive examination for a regular commission. And uh, Although I'd had a strong interest in ROTC, by then I was uh, uh, really looking forward to uh, uh, competing and winning one of the jobs with one of the big uh, elect electrical companies. Uh, had ambitions to be an engineer uh, with RCA or General Electric or Westinghouse, uh, uh, with my ambitions being in the 
largely the radio or re radio related fields. Uh, so I had a parallel interest at that point, and my interests in the ROTC were uh, were influenced to some extent by the exposure I'd had to uh, to the Civil Aeronautics Authority and the Federal Airways and to airplanes and flying and uh, to uh, career opportunities that uh, uh, I could see in the uh, uh, as a military officer. So I had competing interests at that point. Uh, so I, it was not difficult for uh, Colonel Craig to uh, uh, talk me into taking the competitive exam. And somewhat, I guess, to my surprise, I won whatever the competition was and was awarded a uh, regular Army commission as a second lieutenant uh, in the United States Army uh, as compared with a reserve commission. So I had a regular commission uh, with still, I think, a year to go in college. And I, they couldn't award the commission until I reached 21 years of age, which I reached in February of 42. And then, of course, I graduated in uh, the in the, in the spring of 42. So, uh, with uh, Pearl Harbor occurring, there was never any doubt about uh, what I was going to do when I left the university. It was to go into the Army uh, and to go in under the commission that I had.